Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here, and thank you to the IIEA for, for hosting this in cooperation with the, with the Commission, with DG NEAR. Um, we have very strict instructions from the Chair on timing, and uh, as he said also, I do have a presentation which you will receive, so I will try, I will not read out what is on the slides, I'll try and talk around it a bit, uh, try to go quickly, not speak too quickly, as is my <clears throat> unfortunate habit. But let me just try and start with the, with the context. We're talking about the Western Balkans today, but of course, uh, the Western Balkans, uh, the perspective of Western Balkans enlargement is situated within uh, the growth of the European Union from six in 1957 to 28 uh, now. You have, you have here the dates and, and, and who joined. Uh, the point I want to make here is that we had a little debate over lunch as well about the, the um, deepening and, and widening. It was a policy of my country to keep on um, widening in the hope that the European Union wouldn't deepen. In fact, we saw almost the contrary, that as we widened, we also managed to, to get deeper. As we went through these different enlargements, we, uh, we managed to create the single market, we managed to uh, establish the single currency, and we had the Lisbon Treaty to make the Union fit for purpose when we had the enlargement of 2004. So as we have enlarged, we've also, uh, we've also managed to get uh, deeper. And the question of today is what comes next after our 28 member states? So who can apply? Uh, the treaty says uh, that any European state which respects the values referred to in Article 2 and is committed to promoting them may apply to become a member of the European Union. Uh, I note the words European state because it didn't, the treaties didn't used to say European and we had an application from uh, Morocco which was never actually responded to. And the values that we talk about, and this is important for the Western Balkans, so the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. So this is the context, this is what we're aiming at when we say that we can have, uh, that we are open to, to new members. How do they get in there? This is a bit more difficult. Um, we have, as well as the overall, um, they have to be European and they have to share our values. What do they have to do once they've reached that basic uh, criteria? How do they then go forward? Well, we've set out political criteria, economic criteria, and something we call the ability to take on obligations of membership. Um, I'll just focus on that for two seconds. This is the famous acquis, which uh, those of us familiar with the European Union uh, hear this word bandied about. It's a huge body of European legislation which, uh, is, which sets out what the European Union is. And this is the basic thing that we uh, negotiate with uh, the countries over. And we, es we establish that they are able to, and before they join, they have actually taken on this whole body of, of legislation. So the written in summary, We'll come back to them because, of course, and the Peter will talk about them on the economic, I'm sure, much more, but it looks simple, stable democratic institutions, human rights, protection of minorities, rule of law, but these are fundamental. These are fundamental changes in a, in a, in a country to bring them to a, a state of, of political and democratic maturity. This is just a quick uh, slide which shows how they go from being a potential candidate to actually joining in the steps you see, I think, are the tango steps. So you see it's a bit of moving around and going forwards and backwards and sideways. The first step is to submit an application to say they would like to join. Uh, not every European country does want to join. That's absolutely fine. Uh, the Commission, as the guardian of the treaty, is then asked to make an opinion on whether that country should, uh, be able, should start negotiation. This is a huge, um, a huge work, a huge study on the capacity of, of the country. The Commission can make a recommendation, the Council can or cannot accept it. The Council decides in the end to start negotiations, which we start at point three. And then this is this, the stage which has got more and more drawn out over the years. Uh, I think Croatia, I, I think it's eight or nine years of negotiations. Um, and our latest candidates are well on the track uh, in a number of years already. They negotiate, and when we finish the negotiations, we uh, report that they're completed. The Parliament gives its consent, and then, of course, there's the ratification uh, by uh, both the, all of the European member states and the country itself. There's a lot of steps in this, which means a lot of points where the member states can agree, disagree, a lot of points when things hopefully go right, but can also go wrong in their accession uh, process. Focusing down on the Western Balkans, uh, this is where we are, uh, this is the current agenda. Negotiating with Montenegro and Serbia, uh, recognized as candidates but not negotiating with the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia and Albania. 
and the potential candidates of Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and Kosovo. You'll see the asterisk which we put on the reference to Kosovo, and I'll come back to this later. This is, this is really, it's a small asterisk and it's a small text, but this is really fundamental in Kosovo's potential uh, progress towards the European Union. It's unfortunately much more significant than, than it might seem. The big country missing from here is, of course, Turkey. We're not here to talk about Turkey today, so I haven't put it um, uh, in, in the text. Uh, Turkey is also a negotiating uh, country. Uh, its negotiations are in the process of being, of being kick-started, but this is a, a different and a, a very big debate which could take us well off, off today's track. Uh, one word about visa liberalization. So this is not uh, formally part of the accession process, but this is um, something which recognizes the closer relationship that the Western Balkans countries do have to the European Union. Visa liberalization means that the citizens of these countries, people holding the passports, are exempt from uh, needing a visa for short-term tourist travel, so 90 days in the Schengen countries. Uh, all of the, the five of the six countries so far have this visa-free travel. Kosovo, not yet, but if all goes well, should uh, hopefully finalize that process uh, quite soon. It's important because it, it matters very much to the people in the countries of the region to feel this very personal connection with the Union, that they're able to travel for tourism purposes, but they're able to travel freely to the European Union. Uh, speaking with uh, colleagues, friends in Kosovo, you referred to the fact that I have worked on Kosovo. Um, there's a feeling of isolation that somehow the Union doesn't want Kosovo. The, they call themselves the most enclosed uh, country in the world. I think they they think they rate themselves like North Korea in terms of possibilities of traveling without visa. And this holds its own dangers in terms of the development of the country, the um, the, develop, the potential radicalization of, of youth. And so we need to we do need to be very conscious of what it means to the region, to the countries, as well as to the European Union as we, as we look at these issues. It's okay to be neighbors. Not all the European countries will or must join the European <coughs> Union. Uh, I think it's interesting is Iceland, of course, because Iceland decided at one point to go forward with its membership uh, application. And since um, uh, 2015, uh, they've requested that Iceland should not be regarded as a candidate country for EU membership. Um, it's, again, we don't quite know how to deal with countries when they stop somewhere in, in the process. And we got quite far with Norway, and they turned it down in, a, in their referendum. But with Iceland, they've stopped halfway through the process. And we might come to this in the discussion afterwards. But of course, uh, my, my country, the United Kingdom, uh, may end up being one of these neighbors. And the question of <coughs> what kind of relationship would they have with the European Union uh, then becomes very, very, very interesting. So how does it all work in practice? How do we, uh, sitting in Brussels, actually go about uh, engaging with the Western Balkans? Three broad uh, areas. So we report and we monitor. That sounds quite boring, but it is, um, in fact, as I learn every day, a very valuable process in, the, in driving economic and democratic and political change in the countries. We write every year uh, for each of the countries a very detailed uh, report is called the annual uh, report, a uh, country report uh, for each of the countries, um, covering all of the areas that I mentioned before, the political criteria, the economic criteria, and the capacity of the countries to, to be part of the European Union. And uh, for us, it's, um, it's the stage in the year we monitor, we say, this is how we think you've done by comparison to last year, this is how far you have to go. But the, the, the countries take these very seriously, and, and we've re we know, or I'm realizing how often civil society or different interest groups in the countries find these reports extremely useful and helpful in their own attempts to drive change um, in their countries. Part of this is also the actual accession negotiations, which are, drive uh, a lot of uh, two uh, relations with two of our countries. Uh, they are a, a time-intensive uh, process, but you could see them as an extension of the, of the reporting, monitoring, and preparing uh, for accession. Then we have a network of agreements um, called the Stabilization and, and Association Agreements. These are very uh, comprehensive agreements signed now with all of the countries uh, in the region, uh, including Kosovo, as from the 1st of, of April. We had to find a special way of having an agreement with Kosovo because not all member states recognize uh, the country. I'll call it a country. 
but nonetheless, the agreement is more or less as substantial as the others. They're about e um, economic relations, trade relations, political relations, really, again, demonstrating the privileged relationship that the countries in the Western Balkans do have with, with the European Union. And finally, financial and technical assistance. Um, huge, if I could say in a sense, uh, Peter will talk about the EBRD uh, support, but we have, uh, over the uh, last years, given huge financial support to the countries in the region with the aim to drive forward economic and uh, political change. Um, 11.7 billion euros uh, from the period 2014 to 2020, uh, a similar f figure for 20, uh, 2007 to 2013. A billion of this, um, in this current period, we plan to spend on connectivity uh, projects, so uh, building the network of uh, transport and energy networks uh, throughout the region. I will come, I think I have a few minutes, really a couple of minutes, just to go briefly through, through the countries. On the slides, you will see um, more detail. So I thought I would just say what I think is the challenge for each of the, the countries, just in, in a couple of words or one sentence. Uh, for me, the challenge for Montenegro is, is on the rule of law and uh, being the uh, first country to experience the new approach we have to enlargement accession negotiations, where we focus from an early stage and can, throughout the accession enlargement negotiations on the rule of law. So we started negotiating these chapters, so-called, at, the, at the very beginning. We monitor them throughout, and if Montenegro falls backwards on the rule of law, we will stop negotiating on the other more technical chapters. So this is a challenge, I think, for, for Montenegro. The other challenge uh, is that they're a small country, and for them to push ahead towards the union alone uh, will be difficult to engage, I think, um, the member states uh, in that process. Serbia. Serbia's challenge is the normalization of its relations with Kosovo. Uh, Serbia, uh, we have as part of its negotiation, our mandate to negotiate with Serbia that they need to make progress in normalizing relations with Kosovo and by the time of their accession to have a legally binding agreement. We don't say they have to recognize Kosovo, but we say there has to be a legally binding agreement on the normalization of relations. And this is extremely difficult for, for Serbia. Serbia claims Kosovo as part of Serbia. So they, this, is, this will be Serbia's main challenge in moving forward, as, as long, along with, of course, the, the reforms. The former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia will hear a lot more about later, so I will be very uh, brief. The challenge is the political crisis, which I think you will, you will talk about, and how to move out of this uh, to continue forward on, on negotiations. Albania. Uh, that again, the challenge is on the, on the rule of law. And I think here, not just substantively within Albania, but the perception of Albania. We, I think we hear a lot about Albanian criminal organized crime networks throughout the Union. And I think this is a, is a real challenge for Albania, but also a challenge of, of perception. Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, for me, the one challenge, or the main challenge here, is the internal uh, division, the uh, situation in Bosnia, which makes it extremely difficult to agree on uh, an EU path, um, either at the political level or at the very practical level of how to spend EU funds or how to negotiate with us on the stabilization and association agreement. So until these internal structures and institutions in Bosnia are somehow clarified, it's difficult to, to see progress uh, moving very quickly. Kosovo, um, Kosovo's problem is Serbia, uh, put simply, not because Serbia wants to be difficult with Kosovo, but because of the, uh, their, their history and the claims that Serbia has over Kosovo. <laughs> Kosovo's problem is also that five member states don't recognize it. So we, it's difficult within the council to find ways to go forward, which respect, as they should, these five member states' views and positions on Kosovo, uh, but allow us to deal with Kosovo in the same way as we do with the, with the other countries. Uh, finally, uh, the refugee crisis. You referred to it uh, when, you, when you opened, and I think we probably will come back to it uh, during the discussion. This, is, this sets out what we have done, uh, well, part, a very small part of what we've done in the European Union to address the refugee cri crisis. It impacts on the Western Balkans because this was the, one of the main routes over last months, over the last year, for people coming to the European Union. It challenged the countries on that route to deal with the, the migrants. How could they deal with them humanely um, within, with respect for the rule of law? 
Um, it's also an, an issue because many citizens had of these of the Western Balkans countries. Many there have been cases of citizens from these countries um, making uh, asylum claims, unfounded asylum claims in the European Union, and the refugee crisis has has meant that their claims are now being uh, rejected more quickly than than they would be. So they have been challenged also on on that front. Um, it has, on the positive side, allowed us to engage with the countries in the region. Um, as the slide mentions, we had a, what does it mention it? Well, the 17-point plan uh, came out of a meeting of leaders which involved uh, countries in the region on a, on, a, on a level basis, which I think was important, necessary, and valued by, by the countries in the region. I think I've just about stuck to 15 minutes, and this is how you can find us, and I'm looking forward to discussing uh, later. Thank you very much. Tony, thank you very much, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back here at uh, the Institute. Uh, I really, I, I greatly value the work the Institute has done over the years on the Western Balkans. I think it's very important to keep this region in, in focus, and uh, it's a region that uh, is very close to my heart, and I know to many of you as well. Um, I want to... Uh, Give my, my short presentation, I, I want to give a slightly optimistic spin to how I and my colleagues at the EBRD see this region. It's not the first time I've been optimistic about the Western Balkans in, in, this, uh, in this institute and in other venues, uh, but I really feel that there is an opportunity for this region to move forward over the next uh, decade, economically speaking, and of course in parallel with their EU accession process that Catherine has been uh, outlining. Um, I'm basing most of my remarks around this paper that uh, I've made available and will be put on the website. The paper is called How the Western Balkans Can Catch Up. Even the title, uh, we originally phrased the title of this paper as a question, can the Western Balkans catch up? And uh, we were briefing our president and he said to us, well, um, why don't you, uh, this sounds great, but why don't you change the title, take the question mark out and phrase it as a a, a more definitive, uh, not can they, but how, how they can. Uh, so this is what the paper is about. And what I want to do in my uh, short summary of the paper is, uh, is basically three things. So I will show you firstly that although there is a big convergence and competitiveness gap between the Western Balkans and the rest of Europe, that there are uh, definite signs that this gap, these gaps are, are closing. So that's the first point. Uh, secondly, I'll, I'll give you five reasons why we think uh, people and, and companies, investors, should invest in the Western Balkans, five advantages of this region. Uh, and thirdly, I'll give you five areas where we think growth in the coming decade uh, can come from. Now, I'm going to conclude the talk then just with a minute or two on sort of the longer term challenges because I don't want to be totally Panglossian and I want to uh, recognize that there are deep challenges facing this region, but uh, overall, I think it is a region with strong convergence potential. Uh, I'm coming from the EBRD, so I want to uh, just say uh, firstly about uh, our involvement in the region. We are, uh, I think by any measure, the largest investor uh, in, in the region, particularly in, in private sector development, which is really at the core uh, of our mandate, we've uh, over the uh, 20 plus years we've been active here, we've invested uh, cumulatively 9.3 billion euros uh, and have an active portfolio at the moment of uh, 5.2 uh, billion euros. And the charts show you the, uh, the, the spread by sector uh, and by country, but you can see that we're, we're quite well spread across different sectors, although obviously with a, a strong uh, emphasis on transport and energy, but also financial institutions and uh, general industry. And the right-hand chart shows you the, uh, the breakdown by uh, country. Again, Serbia, naturally, as the biggest country, taking the lion's share of uh, our investments. So we, we have a, a strong commitment to this region, uh, a strong presence on the region, offices in all, uh, in all countries, and uh, a very active pipeline of projects we would expect to invest this year somewhere in the region of uh, 800 million, possibly up to 1 billion uh, euro across these uh, six countries. Now, when it comes to uh, convergence, uh, this chart I, uh, I, I like showing because it, uh, it crystallizes the, 
the gap in living standards between the Western Balkans and the, and the rest of Europe. And it can be summarized in, in three fractions, one half, one third, and one quarter. Roughly speaking, Western Balkan countries on average have about half the GDP per capita adjusted for purchasing parity of the uh, Eastern European, Central and Eastern European countries that have joined the EU in the last, well, since uh, 2004. Uh, it's roughly one third of the GDP in Southern European EU countries, and it's about a quarter of the GDP per capita in, in Western European uh, countries. So that's, a size, that, that's an indication of the size of the challenge uh, and it's a reflection of the lack of competitiveness of this region. Now, in this table, I'm summarizing uh, probably the most comprehensive overview of competitiveness globally, which is the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report. Uh, not, I'm not going to go into any of the details, but just to highlight in red some of the areas where the Western Balkans, on that measure, really lags behind. The quality of infrastructure, uh, the, the quality of labor market uh, functioning and efficiency, and uh, a pillar called business sophistication, which has to do with really uh, sort of more uh, advanced ways of running business, uh, professional management, developing value chains, and uh, the like. So these are some of the areas where the Western Balkans uh, lags behind. Nevertheless, if you look at how these indicators have changed since 2007, you'll see in this chart a significant progress in the Western Balkans relative to other EU countries. Whether you take the whole EU, or whether you look at the EU 15, this is the pre-2004 members, or the EU 11, which are the 11 Central and Eastern European countries that joined in 2004 or later. You get a similar story if you look at World Bank governance indicators. There is discernible progress in the last eight years in the Western Balkans versus stagnation elsewhere in the EU. So in that important sense, in terms of competitiveness and governance, there is catch-up and convergence going on in the Western Balkans. Now, what can the region offer to investors? Well, uh, I said I'd give you five things to offer, uh, and the first one is the prospective EU membership, so I will not say any more about this because uh, Catherine very uh, eloquently uh, described uh, that process and where we, where we stand, but I think it is very important for us at the EBRD trying to bring investors to the region to emphasize this, uh, this perspective, the perspective of long-term membership <coughs> for all of these countries. Secondly, macroeconomic uh, stability. Uh, sometimes it's perceived in common discourse that these are very poor basket case countries, but they're not. And, and uh, macroeconomically, they're quite stable. They have low inflation. They have fiscal deficits that are broadly under control. Some of them are currently in IMF programs at the moment. Uh, and that's helping to uh, anchor macroeconomic stability. Uh, and exchange rates are all closely tied to uh, uh, the euro, uh, which helps, uh, I think, low inflation. Thirdly, the uh, strategic location. Uh, so this region is, uh, well, on the doorstep of the EU. It offers uh, free access to EU markets for most goods. Uh, it's linked by the various trans-European corridors. But also, it's in becoming of increasing interest to uh, other investors, and notably uh, the Chinese. Now, uh, China uh, has increasingly recognized the importance of the Western Balkans as a gateway to Europe. Uh, you'll see this also. China's uh, interest in Southeastern Europe more generally is, uh, is increasing very rapidly. Most recently, China, Chinese investors have uh, completed the privatization of Piraeus port in, in Greece. And they see that then as a gateway up through uh, Europe with various infrastructure plans. This is a very exciting development, I think, for Southeastern Europe and the Western Balkans uh, in particular. Uh, the economies are quite diverse. Uh, the chart is showing the uh, sectoral breakdown by different countries. I think the point is here, the point here is that no country is excessively reliant on one or two industries. That there's quite a broad spread and therefore quite a broad spread of uh, opportunities for, uh, for investors, with, of course, differences within countries that are you can see here. Uh, and lastly, uh, taxes and labor costs. So the left-hand chart shows the total tax burden 
as a percentage of profit. You'll see that on average in the Western Balkans, it's significantly lower than in the EU. On the right-hand side, you see unit labor costs, which again are quite favorable relative to EU standards, not surprisingly given the, uh, given the living standards and overall GDP in, in the region. So again, from an investor point of view, these are not necessarily decisive, but they are part of the mix. They're part of the mix of decisions of investors when they are uh, looking whether to locate here or somewhere, somewhere else. Okay, so uh, having, I hope, uh, convinced you that there are reasons to invest here, where will the growth come from in, uh, in the next 10 years? Well, we think uh, foreign direct investment is really uh, crucial. And in this, the region has lagged behind, as the left-hand chart shows. Again, you see Western Balkan uh, FDI stock per capita around 2.2, uh, 2,500 2, euro uh, per capita, relative to more than 14,000 in the uh, EU. Uh, so uh, this chart, in a way, matches quite closely the, the convergence gap that I highlighted at the, at the start. So attracting more investment is really critical for these countries, and we would expect it to come from non-traditional sources increasingly in the coming decade, like China, like the uh, Gulf countries, which we see now investing in uh, Serbia and, and uh, some, other, uh, some other countries as well. It's very important that this is concentrated into tradable sectors, which brings me to my next point, that trade integration in this region is below potential. What the left-hand chart shows is a standard measure of trade openness. This is exports plus imports divided by GDP, which is, again, on average, well below uh, even the EU 11 uh, standards, never mind, the, uh, never mind the EU. So this is a sign that, to date, countries are not yet sufficiently integrated into EU and, and, and global uh, supply chains, and that there's a need to upgrade the sophistication of uh, exported goods. Uh, transport infrastructure, this is a, a, a key area for uh, EBRD, other IFIs, and of course for the European Union as a whole to, to try and improve the quality of transport uh, infrastructure. Here again, I'm showing you the, the World Economic Forum competitiveness indicators, and which show you how uh, the size of the gap that needs to be bridged in the coming uh, years. Because of the lack of fiscal space, Increasingly, these countries will have to search for private sector solutions, and this is something that the EBRD can, can really help with. Uh, energy sector we see as having strong potential in the uh, region. There are a number of significant energy projects uh, underway or in the, in the pipeline. Uh, increasingly, this region is seen as a, an important transit region for gas, and there are two pipelines currently uh, again, either underway or, or, or about to begin, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline and the Ionian Adriatic Pipeline. Uh, but uh, also we can see significant gains coming from improving energy efficiency uh, and through greater regional cooperation through the uh, energy community. And lastly, we think there's strong potential for innovation to drive growth. What this chart is showing you is a survey that we in the World Bank do every few years, Business Environment an enterprise performance survey, where we asked firms uh, the extent to which they are introducing new products or processes or new standards of uh, organizational uh, uh, organization or, or marketing. Uh, so in the Western Balkans, you don't have much R&D going on, uh, and you don't have much world leaders in, in, in new products, but you do have a lot of companies which are willing to adopt and adapt to take new technology that's been developed elsewhere and uh, introduce it into their own companies. And when you combine this with w relatively well-educated workforces and relatively low labor costs, then I think there's really potential for this sector to, uh, to be an important growth driver in the coming decade. Lastly, long-term challenges and risks. I just want to mention four of them. I think we may take up some of them in the, in the discussion. Uh, I think uh, I've, I've highlighted, uh, I've, I've shown here the stuck in transition chart. I think I presented this report here a couple of years ago. This is our 2013 transition report, stuck in transition, which argued that many countries in the region have really come to a bit of a, a block in their reform process. And this, I think, is true to some extent for some of the Western Balkan countries. 
Uh, it is harder to do reforms when you're not growing much. This is one of the lessons I think we've learned in, in, in transition. And there is the risk that if countries stay stuck in transition, then their growth rates and their convergence will, 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 uh, will lag behind. Uh, a second long-term issue is financial sector fragility. Uh, the financial sectors in this region have managed to survive the crisis quite well. They're dominated by foreign-owned banks. But nevertheless, we see a, a strong need for greater regional cooperation and cooperation with the EU uh, bodies as well within the new European uh, financial architecture. Uh, demographic and inclusion trends, these are quite worrying for some of these countries. Uh, falling populations, low labor force participation, strong migration pressures outwards, as, as we've uh, already uh, mentioned. I think these, these are issues that need to be addressed. And lastly, uh, we haven't mentioned yet, I think, today, but global warming and climate change is a very important long-term threat to this region that I think needs to be addressed now in order to avoid big problems down the road. Thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon. I do hope that I'll keep the optimism going at least for until the uh, presentation is over or at least until the 6th of June. But then it's the barrel bomb of the, of the Balkans. There are three titles that are very important in, in our policy brief. New Approach for Macedonia is the main title, and that's uh, one of the important, uh, important titles. The Barrel Bomb of the Balkans is the other one. And the third one is, are we near enough? Uh, questioning whether, whether there will be any, any work left for DG Near to do. If, uh, if nothing is done until the 5th of June. As many of uh, the other speakers mentioned so far, Macedonia has been living in, in a state of permanent political crisis since December 2012. It was on the 24th of December that uh, the opposition and journalists were kicked out of parliament just for the sake of uh, enacting the law on budget. Uh, according to the model and uh, the ex to fit the expenses or the expenditures of the ruling party. Since then, uh, the EU supported or facilitated a, an agreement that uh, put everything below the carpet, and that bump grew, and we were stumbled uh, on the bump uh, last year in February 2012. 2013 was the extension of the crisis. 2014 were uh, the early parliamentary elections, the last early parliamentary elections, and the regular presidential, upon uh, which we ended up with the same government as before and with the same president as before. The opposition stated that they don't recognize their election results and boycotted the parliament and their work. OSC, oh dear, the mission just evaluated or concluded on the elections that they were efficiently administered, including on the election day, but they failed to credit the elections as fair, free, democratic, and most of all, credible. Uh, last year in February, the wiretapping scandal uh, was, was out, uh, and that was a new insight of uh, how situation is in Macedonia or how uh, things were done in the past in Macedonia. Uh, the released wiretap conversations uh, opened up to allegations of crime or criminal uh, actions on behalf of uh, high governmental officials, uh, electoral involving electoral fraud, uh, corruption, and etc. The EU again facilitated uh, or sponsored an agreement that was reached on first on the 2nd of June, then on the 15th of July. It was in the residence of the EU ambassador in Skopje in a neighborhood called Perzino and thus uh, Perzino Accord. It doesn't mean much uh, when, it's come to, it, when it comes to the name, but uh, it means quite a lot when you see all of the steps on the pathway towards uh, bringing back democracy and guaranteeing rule of law in the country, and then holding credible elections, which were supposed to be on the 24th of uh, April, so last weekend, 
but they were again postponed for the 5th of June because the international community came out and said that there are no conditions for elections, at least no conditions for credible elections in the country. Uh, the important thing about uh, Persino, and you, you will all have uh, already received some of the materials, there is an infographic showing the implementation phase of uh, Persino and all its uh, 23 uh, steps on the pathway. And you'll see that most of the steps have not been implemented or have been implemented until a point in time. And then uh, something happened that uh, took a reverse turn and brought back the situation as it was prior to the conclusion of the agreement. Uh, some of the most important things uh, of uh, some of the most important steps of the Persian Accord are uh, the constitution of a government for uh, organizing elections uh, that had uh, two ministers from the opposition in, uh, in the government, the Minister of Interior, that's clearly in charge for organizing or uh, facilitating the organization of the elections, uh, and the Minister of uh, Labor and Social Policy that has to do a lot with uh, where the government was uh, drawing its support in the previous electoral cycles. Uh, the important thing here uh, about this step is that uh, on the 14th of April, after the dissolution of parliament, the government adopted a decision stripping those two ministers of their competencies and bringing the state back to prior to their uh, appointment in the government. The other important step is uh, the appointment of a special prosecutor to investigate and uh, prosecute uh, the people that are implicated with uh, with the wiretapping scandal. Uh, in March this year, uh, the Constitutional Court decided that uh, the law on presidential pardon was unconstitutional, one of part of the, of the law, its amendments from 2009, and uh, decided that uh, the president should have uh, authority to give pardon to people that have committed electoral fraud. Surprisingly enough, the first case of the special prosecutor was on electoral fraud. Uh, and on the 12th of uh, April, after parliament has been dissolved, uh, the president mm -hmm. decided to par give, issue pardon to 56 individuals that have been implicated in, uh, in all of the cases that so far have been developed by the special prosecutor. What is important here is that uh, this brought to a point that we started, we. I'm part of, uh, of the movement, but uh, everybody, everybody that's free thinking or pro-Western, -demo pro pro-democratic, pro-EU in, in a way uh, participates in the colorful revolution, demanding that uh, democracy is brought back to the country and rule of law is uh, guaranteed. If, if we go further on and discuss why it's the barrel bomb or why uh, do we question are we near enough, uh, we need to look into public support for, for the EU or public support for uh, EU's work in the country. In our last year's uh, research that was conducted during the, the releases of the wiretaps, wiretap communications. We found out that 60% of the people demanded the involvement of the international community, but also the involvement of the EU in settling or resolving the crisis. 67% uh, of the people, uh, of the surveyed people demanded, uh, well, said that they would vote yes in a referendum to join the EU if it was held that Sunday, that particular Sunday. Uh, this is important because if you analyze it further on, Macedonia is uh, a mixture of cultures, religions, ethnicities, etc. Macedonia, well, Salat Macedon actually shows how, how difficult or how a mixture is, uh, the country is. Albanian population has a support of 93, 95% of the Albanians say that they want to join the EU. Macedonia support, Macedonians' support is significantly lower. When we go to 
political parties, the ruling party of the Macedonians, the demo Christian, supposedly demo Christian, Vamero uh, Dapamane, has 50.2% support for EU accession. They have been very vocal in saying that they have been pressured into negotiating a deal. This is something that the EU and the Western world is imposing on, on the country and that secret services from foreign countries are working to uh, destroy the country. If the elections on the 5th of June take place, this divide and this conflict that was so far between the Macedonians will switch to being between Macedonians and Albanians. Albanians will feel disenchanted by their political parties because they have participated in the elections and Vomero Dapamane will be more free to say that, okay, now we are dropping, uh, dropping the EU and NATO accession and we'll look for other alternatives. So far, Erdogan has been promoted as the best alternative possible. Uh, for development without uh, democracy, and uh, the EU has facilitated also other examples in the case of Hungary and illiberal democracy according to the understanding of uh, Prime Minister Orban. So if this happens, if uh, the country actually, because of the ruling party, drops EU accession as, as an objective, what we are to expect is that this will become uh, an, an inter-ethnic conflict, and then that's the moment when Macedonia enters into its explosive phase, thus the Battle of the Balkans. What to do in order to uh, prevent this, or how to react to prevent this? Uh, mind you, we have to take actions now, uh, in the next week, rather than wait for the elections, because if we wait for the elections, then it's all over. We have already lost uh, all of the strings that we, ha we were pulling, so now we, we have to take decisive and uh, stronger actions. First of all, we, f we feel that the EU failed to recognize its core values, democracy and rule of law in the case of Macedonia and failed to show consistency in its approach towards Macedonia, at least from the Persian Accord on. We also feel that uh, there is a consensus built upon Macedonia between Parliament, Council and the Commission, according to what uh, MEP Richard Howitt said. Uh, he was uh, the previous rapporteur from the Parliament on, on Macedonia. So if there is actually a consensus, and if the MEPs, three of, uh, to be uh, exact, apart from Howard uh, Kukan from Slovakia and Ivo Weigel from Slovenia, all three represented different uh, political groups in, in the parliament, have been involved in the facilitation of the agreement. In order to include both the commission and council, we should change sponsor instead of Commissioner Hahn to High Representative and Commission Vice President Federica Mogherini, just to represent both of the institutions on the table. Involve some of the most influential EU member states, because so far we have seen that uh, on the ground, Germany, UK, France, and Italy have been more involved, have been producing more uh, results, and have been uh, imposing their influence, national influence on the government in, well, producing some form of reforms. In order for this sextet to work or to produce some form of uh, results, first of all, we need to have uh, a decision on negotiations enabling measures, meaning we need to force political party leaders into <clears throat> negotiations by blacklisting some of uh, the 56 pardoned individuals by a point, well, deciding on assets freeze on some of those 56 uh, pardoned individuals. Mind you, there are some that have uh, dual nationality, Macedonian and also uh, nationality of EU member states. And uh, finally, maybe even go into deciding on funds freeze 
blocking the implementation of some of the EPA uh, projects or uh, reprogramming uh, EPA in order to, uh, to, well, achieve more results. This is the sticks approach. And according to uh, James K. Lindsay, it's the slowly, slowly uh, approach. Uh, on the other side, we need to have the carrots approach. And here with the carrots, well, to rephrase Baroness Thatcher, uh, democracy and rule of law are absolutely non-negotiable. In that sense, uh, we need to take uh, the urgent reform priorities and previous reports from last year transform it into a rule of law action plan, establish a transitional government for a period of one or two years that will have, apart from politicians, experts sitting in the government, to implement the rule of law action plan, and also redesign this rule of law action plan as a, as a pre-negotiations for chapters 23 and 24, just for the sake of keeping the country on track. And as I said prior to, to the seminar, uh, the EU needs uh, to showcase good examples or needs lessons learned for other, uh, for other countries. The process is long. It takes seven, eight years. And countries are taking the examples of, of their bad friends rather than from their good friends. If the EU is decisive enough in tackling the Macedonian issue, as it should, I believe that you won't have the same problems with Serbia soon enough, and you won't have the same problems with Bosnia and Herzegovina. <laughs>